drugs. We both knew they were. I was a professor of psychology at the University of Connecticut, clinical psychology. I was seeing clients, I had a small private practice, I had someone who was very depressed, I would sometimes refer them to psychiatric colleagues to get prescriptions for medication on the shame. <laughs> Wouldn't do it again. Um, but I knew they worked, we all knew they worked, but we were interested in it was a placebo effect. I've been interested in the placebo effect for my entire academic career. You might say I'm addicted to placebo research. I've tried to keep it happy. I even joined Placebos Anonymous. <laughs> where the first step was to admit that I don't really have a problem at all. But it didn't work. I couldn't stop analyzing and doing studies on the placebo effect. And it occurred to both Guy and, and to me that there ought to be a strong placebo effect in the treatment of depression. And the reason for that is that one of the core features of depression is a sense of hopelessness. And if you're going to get a new medication that holds promise, that might instill some hope, counter the hope, hopelessness. So there ought to be a good size placebo effect in depression, we thought. And we wanted to evaluate it, so we went to the literature. And we looked for treatment for studies in which people had been randomized to get an antidepressant drug. Actually, we didn't. We looked for studies in which people would randomize to get a placebo or no treatment. The only place we could find studies in which people were randomized to get a placebo were in the drug trials. So we had the drug data. We weren't particularly interested in it at that point, but we had it. What does a researcher do when he or she has data? We analyzed it. So we analyzed it, and we found that uh, people given an antidepressant drug, on average, did fairly well. It was a big within group effect size. But people who were given placebo also did very well. And uh, people who were given no treatment at all didn't do very well at all. Now, about 25% of the improvement that you saw in people who got antidepressant medication. You saw that also with no treatment at all, not even placebo. Another 50% of the response to the drug was a placebo effect, a real placebo effect, because it was above the response to know what happens when you don't get any treatment at all, and that left only 25% as a genuine drug effect, apparently. Uh, that Oops, I didn't remind that, sorry about that. I'm pressing the wrong button. <laughs> and that was late, later, uh, more recently replicated in the study. One of the problems with our first meta-analysis is there weren't any studies that had both the drug and no treatment. So we wanted to, to, to uh, find, compare placebo response to no treatment. We found those in the psychotherapy study. So it's a different group of studies. People do that in meta-analyses, but it's not as clean as having it come from the same study. And here's the same findings from a single study that Andrew Leuchter did at UCLA. So they had a group getting medication in supportive care, a group getting placebo in supportive care, they do virtually identical. There's actually no significant difference between improvement in those two groups, but both of them do much better to get supportive care, talking to the doctor, or whatever frequency they, they do in the, in the drug, uh, the other two groups, uh, but as you see, very little improvement there. Well, we published our results, titled it, Listening to Prozac but Hearing Placebo. And as you might imagine, it proved to be very controversial. One of the critics said, your analysis is flawed. It derives from a minuscule group of unrepresentative, inconsistently, and erroneously selected articles. Pretty strong criticism, what would you do? Well, one colleague who I've never met before, he actually just contacted me out of the blue, Tom Moore, who was at Georgetown University at that time, 
contacted me and he said, saw your article, loved it, saw the controversy and the response to it, got an idea for you. Why don't you replicate your own study with a totally different data set? And I've got a suggestion for you is what data set to use. Why don't you go to the FDA, use the Freedom of Information Act, and get the data that the drug company sent to the FDA in the process of gaining approval for their products and analyze those, see what you come up with. And I said, that's a great idea. Look, you're in Washington, D.C., let's work on this together. Can you get the uh, information from the FDA and we'll send a copy to me, we'll both analyze it to see if there are any differences in our, in our results. He said, sure, and he did it. We obtained from the FDA, he obtained from the FDA, the uh, data sent to them from the, by the manufacturers of what at that time were the six most widely prescribed antidepressants. Now the FDA data set is unique, it's especially important. First of all, it's the basis for approval of all these drugs. Now one of the arguments that people continue to make, they say these trials are no good. They're going in this way, they're bad in that way. We'll talk about some of the specifics in a, in, a, in, a, in a little bit. But the bottom line is, if there's something methodologically wrong with these trials, the drug should never have been approved at all because they were the basis of drug approval. It's also important because it contains data on all of the trials <coughs> done by the companies that are trying to get their drugs approved. And that's important because it turns out that 40% of those trials were never published. Why weren't they published? Right. Well, yeah, you look at the results, you look at the published trials, three out of four of them showed statistically significant benefit for drug over placebo. You look at the unpublished trials, that falls to 12%. <coughs> so we have the published trials, now we've got the unpublished trials, we put them all together, and what do we get? Well, again, a nice big response to the drug, and a nice big response to the placebo, and the difference is even smaller than in the published trials, of course. More than 80% of the response to the drug is duplicated in the placebo groups. And the difference on the Hamilton depression scale, which was the dependent variable and the primary outcome on all of these uh, trials, the difference was less than two points. On the Hamilton scale, the ranges and you get anywhere from zero to 53 points on it. Now that is statistically significant, but is it clinically meaningful? I mentioned for and this is probably you know all of this, but let me just take a second to mention it. The difference between statistical and clinical significance. People still confuse it. People who ought to know better, people who probably know better, but don't want to. In this particular case. Statistical significance assesses whether an effect is real or not. Did it just occur to chance, or is there something really happening? It doesn't tell you anything about the signs of the effect. Clinical significance has to do with how large the effect is. What kind of difference would it make in somebody's life? Would it have any meaningful impact at all? Imagine, as an example, that a study on 500,000 peak subjects finds that smiling increases life expectancy by 10 seconds. <laughs> With a sample of 500,000, I can virtually guarantee you that that 10 second difference will be statistically significant. But so here we have the uh, 2.8 difference. The National Institute of Health and Clinical Estimates so changed their name again. It's still the acronym is NICE. National Institute now for uh, Excellent Healthcare Excellence, something like that. Anyway, in um, the UK, which sets the treatment guidelines uh, for the National Health Service there, and they proposed a criterion for clinical safety of a difference in at least, three, at least three points between drug and placebo on the Hamilton scale. And as you can see, 
doesn't come close. So we published those data in 2002, and one of the things that the critics said was, the patients weren't depressed enough. One of the problems with the trials, you see, um, they said, sure, you know, you take people who are only mildly or moderately depressed, and you give them anything, they'll probably get better. But we see really depressed people, severely depressed people, and they need the actual drug in order to improve. So we went back to the data, and we looked at the same data we had analyzed, and we looked at what were the baseline scores. And here's what we found. There, was, there were no trials with mild, mildly depressed patients at all. They were excluded from all. There was one trial with moderately depressed patients. That was an early trial of fluoxetine, known as Prozac in the US anyway. They have different brand names in different uh, countries, where there was zero difference at all. They stopped allowing mild and moderately depressed people into the studies after that. There were no studies with severely depressed people on average. All the rest of the studies were done in people who would be diagnosed as very severely depressed. That still didn't meet the NICE criteria. There's now they're getting a difference. It's still under three points. But you'll notice there is a difference, and there was a difference as a function of severity, and there were a small group of studies on very severely, extremely severely uh, depressed patients. And they actually did surpass the NICE guidelines. They would account for maybe less, for about 10%, one in 10 people that um, would be prescribed antidepressants would fit into that very severely depressed category. Most people are in the category that they excluded, moderately and severely uh, depressed. So it passed it, still a small, difference on a scale of that size, but it did pass the proposed NICE criterion for clinical significance. Well, we published those results in 2008. That was the one that hit the fan, as they say. And what did the critics say? They said, well, the patients were too depressed. <laughs> that was in an editorial in Nature Reviews Drugs, Drug Discovery. What the heck were they thinking of? They said, well, look, you've got people who are moderately depressed, you've got people who are very severely depressed, but you don't have any studies on people who are severely depressed, not very severely and not moderately. Maybe they're the ones who show the benefit of the drug. <laughs> I guess they were proposing the re response curve that looked like that. I call that the Loch Ness Monster hypothesis. <laughs> Seems unlikely, but I guess it's at least possible, right? What are we going to do now? Fortunately, we didn't have to do anything. Jay Fournier and his group, at, research group in uh, Pennsylvania did a patient-level analysis of six antidepressant trials in which they had, and these were not FDA trials, so they had uh, studies in there that had uh, they had patients who were just mildly depressed, moderately, severely, very severely, doing this patient level analysis. Here's the PF. And again, this small group of extremely depressed patients that do cross the nice threshold. The rest do not. So the next thing the critics said is, well, the NICE criteria are arbitrary. <laughs> and they are right. They are arbitrary. They are as arbitrary as setting 0.05 as statistical significance. They're as arbitrary as saying that a person's responded to treatment if they have a 50% reduction in symptoms, but not a 49% reduction in symptoms, and they're non responsive they're as arbitrary as setting remission at eight point, less than eight points on a Hamilton scale. All of those are arbitrary. What would a non-arbitrary criterion look like? Well, researchers in the field of pain have <coughs> tackled that same problem with pain medications, and they have a solution to it. There's the scale called 
the uh, global impressions, the, the uh, clin clinical global impressions of improvement scale, in which clinicians rate their patients as being very much worse, much worse, minimally worse, no change at all, minimally improved, much improved, very much improved. And uh, they said we should have at least much improved as our criterion for clinical <coughs> significance. And then they look at what amount of change on a patient pain rating scale corresponds to a clinician rating of much improved. And it turns out to be about two points on a 10 point scale. Let's say we take that same strategy, which Joanna Moncrief and I have done, and apply that to antidepressants and depression in the Hamilton scale. What are the changes on the Hamilton scale? Uh, how they correspond to clinician ratings of clinical change. Lloyd, not Lloyd's German study I showed you earlier, but a different researcher, Lloyd and his colleagues, have looked at this with the raw data from a number of clinical trials, more than 7,000 patients. And in each of these trials, they had both the mean improvement on the Hamilton scale, they had the Hamilton scale scores, and they had the ratings on the clinical global impressions uh, the improvement scale. And the question is, what was the mean change, the mean improvement on the Hamilton change, because it could be in the opposite direction also, on the Hamilton for people who were rated as minimally worse, no change, minimally, minimally improved, and so on. Here it is. A three-point change, which is what NICE was suggesting as a criterion of clinical improvement, a three-point change is equivalent to a, that's the mean change, the average change among patients who have been rated by their clinicians has not had any change at all. No change. Now what would you say should be a good criterion for clinical significance? Minimally improved, much improved? Well, minimally improved you would need a seven point change on the Hamilton. Much improved, a 14 point change. Those are big changes. Nobody, nobody, nobody gets them. Let's take a look at uh, how the, the data we got here correspond to these empirically derived criteria. Even the most the, the most depressed people cross the barrier of no, no change at all, but still don't reach the threshold of even minimal improvement on average. And so the critics say, well, that's an average, but you know, some people benefit and some don't. And you know, you have to find the ones that do, we're gonna do research because we can't find the ones who do. We don't know which, who's gonna respond and who isn't. So far, I have found one study in the, li in the literature that uh, has found a difference that they can point to that predicts who's going to improve better than placebo and who isn't. Depressed patients who are given antidepressants. The study is by uh, uh, Hunter, Amy Hunter at UCLA, working with, uh, also with Andrew Royster. And here you can see two groups of patients. And uh, you can see with one group, there's a big drug placebo difference, right? And with the other group, everybody gets better. And there's a zero difference between drug and placebo. They published that in 2010, and that was so unusual, they decided to see if they could replicate it with an independent data set, and published that in 2015, exact same results. So the question is, what is this variable that predicts whether someone's gonna benefit more than placebo or not on an antidepressant? And what it is, is whether they've ever had an antidepressant if you've had an antidepressant before, you do better on the antidepressant than on the placebo. If you've never been treated with an antidepressant, <coughs> no difference at all. Why? Maybe, maybe it's because the people who've been on antidepressants know, uh, before know what they feel like and more likely to break one and realize when they're not getting one, they're just getting placebo. Could be, we don't know why. 
But that's the only the, the difference that we can find. So the critic's last resort. I call it the true believer hypothesis. The noted pharmacologist in the UK, David Nutt, said, antidepressants work. Everybody knows they work. And another critic said, millions of content patients can't be that wrong. Well, the history of medicine is replete with treatments that have worked for millions of patients. <laughs> and that's why we don't rely on clinical judgments without research to decide what's effective and what isn't. That we do controlled clinical trials, and I'm happy to report when you do a controlled clinical trial and an antidepressant, everybody gets the same results. There's no crisis of replication. Some of these, Putin Lockus is one of my harshest critics, claimed I did, the, did it wrong, made mistakes in the analysis, reanalyzed the data, got a slightly different result. You can see hardly any difference at all, and actually we found the mistake that he made uh, in it. Everyone gets the same results, and I would especially want to call your attention to the Stone 2018 data. <coughs> Mark Stone is a, is a deputy director for safety and psychiatric drugs at the FDA. And uh, he has this data set that involves patient level data on more than 73,000 patients, 228 clinical trials. He's analyzed those. He gets a mean drug placebo difference of 1.8 on the hammer, which is Exactly what we reported on uh, just our six trials with much smaller sample subjects. Here's how um, Tom Logren characterized these results. Logren was at that time the director of the FDA Psychiatric Products Division. He was in, interviewed on the same 60 Minutes uh, broadcast. And here's what he said to Leslie Stone. The data that we have shows that the drugs are effective. But what about the degree of effectiveness? I think we all agree that the, the changes that you see in the short-term trials, the difference between improvement in drug and placebo is rather small. I love the look on your face. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that great? Did you notice that he said the, um, the difference that you see in the short-term trials? And what he's alluding to is that there are long-term trials. See, these trials, that's another problem with the trials that they should not have accepted as being adequate and well-controlled and used them to approve the drugs. They were all too short. Well, here's an analysis, another analysis of short-term trial, of long-term trials, eight weeks or longer. Uh, and what they're looking at is uh, difference between drug and placebo at 8 weeks, at 12 weeks, at 16 weeks, and at 20 weeks. What did it get? Our criteria now are empirically derived criteria. At 8 weeks, there's a difference between drug and placebo in terms of standardized mean differences. At 12 weeks, at 16 weeks, and at 20 weeks. It doesn't matter how long the trial goes on. The drug placebo difference does not increase. By the way, the drug placebo difference that uh, we obtained was, uh, in terms of standardized units like that, was uh, 0.32. Uh, a fellow just came out with a uh, new meta-analysis in Lancet, claiming to be the biggest ever done, not as big as Mark Stone is from the FDA, but no, no less claiming to be the biggest and say, look, they work, the drugs work. There's a statistically significant difference. Effect size, 0 0.30. Same thing everybody else. Yeah, it's much ado about nothing. So we all agree, says Tom Waldron, 
The difference in improvement between drug and placebo is rather small, and I will just amend that to say that's true in the long-term trials as well. It's so small that clinicians can't even see it as change at all. There's a difference at all. To not see how small it is, you have to hide your head in the sand, <laughs> like an ostrich or a drug company sales rep. <laughs> <laughs> and these are the FDA trials which are biased towards the drug. Why do I say they're biased towards the drug? Because they are all industry-funded trials, and here's what we know about the outcome of industry-funded trials. Here's what happens in trials that are funded by the manufacturer. We're in three out of four of them, so a significant benefit between drug and placebo. Well, that's in the published data anyway. They don't publish anything, but still, that's what they report. Trials that have an independent sponsor, that drops down to 50%. And trials that are sponsored by a competitor, that drops down to 28%. Depends who funds the trial. How does the industry bias their results? Well, here's what they do. First thing they do is they screen out any patients um, who are unlikely to show a difference between drug and placebo. They screen out the mildly and moderately depressed, chronically depressed, people who have not responded to antidepressants in the past, people with comorbid. Uh, conditions, people who are suicidal, then they have a placebo <laughs> washout period, which by the way, we can talk about the ethics of that because they don't tell patients in the trials they're gonna do this in the informed consent form, and they never disclose it. What that means is the first couple of weeks, everybody's put on placebo without being told they're being put on placebo. And anyone who gets better is chunked out of the trial. Then you randomize the rest to either stay on placebo or be switched to an antidepressant. In philosophy and surgical mean trials that were submitted to the FDA, I don't know how the FDA decided these are adequate and well controlled, they did a very strange thing. During the first few weeks of the actual trial, when people, half the people were already on the antidepressant drug, people who did not respond to the drug were excluded from the trial and replaced by new patients. Didn't have a new placebo condition, only a new drug condition. You let me do studies like that, I'll get effects on anything you want. Just take people who aren't responding the way you want them to, kick them out and replace them with new subjects. That's what they did. Patients in these trials were not represented in the clinical practice. It's another criticism that critics make, and it's absolutely true. They're not. And in order to evaluate that and counter it, there's a particularly important trial that was done called the STAR-D trial. Right? STAR-D trial, they relaxed all of these exclusion criteria. They took in mildly depressed, moderately depressed, severely, very severely, suicidal people with comorbid uh, conditions, people that would be excluded from conventional clinical trials, but are within the population that gets prescribed antidepressant medications, were included in this no placebo because they want to be much as, as, as much like clinical practice as possible. So that everyone got an SSRI, no one got a, 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 a placebo, um, and what they found. Was the first thing I find of interest is almost 80% of the patients in the STARTY trial, a broadly representative of those people who are being prescribed antidepressants in clinical practice, would have been excluded from a conventional clinical trial. So, what's the impact of those exclusion criteria? And what is the response to antidepressants in this much more representative population of the uh, people who are given antidepressants, prescribed antidepressants? We went and we got the 
raw data from the starting <coughs> trial through the NIH, the National Institute, NIMH, the National Institute of Mental Health, which had funded the trial, the most expensive trial <coughs> ever done, had uh, cost uh, 34 million US dollars. Pretty expensive trial. Uh, so we got, we got this meta-analysis and some of the data from it that uh, Brad Rutherford had done. And uh, he looked, he, his interest was what's the effect of knowing you're getting a treatment versus thinking you might be getting a placebo. And so he's got the response to antidepressants in comparator trials where there's no placebo. Everyone knows they're getting an active antidepressant. They're randomized either get this antidepressant or that antidepressant. And you see there's almost a 15 point change in the health and scale. You give the same paid people an antidepressant, but tell them they may be getting a placebo, and that improvement falls down to 11 points on the health. And you get more than eight points improvement on the placebo. So we look at that difference, and knows the difference between response to the drug as a function of whether you think you might be getting a placebo, that difference is larger than the difference between drug and placebo in regular trials. What about this much more representative stamp, uh, sample where these people haven't been excluded in the STAR-D trial? What was their response and what we should we compare it to? Well, the one thing that's similar about uh, the STAR-D trial and the comparator trials is that there's no placebo. That's, so that would be what you would want to compare it to. That's where it's methodologically more similar. Everyone knows, thinks they're getting a, a, a real antidepressant, knows they are, and in fact they are. Here's the response in the start of the trial. What you'll notice is that it's not only much smaller than the response to antidepressants in conventional trials, but it's even much smaller, than, it's even smaller than the placebo response in antidepressant, conventional antidepressant trials. And what we don't know is how much of this six point improvement, which is not even minimally improved on the, um, in terms of corresponding scores on the clinical scale of global improvement, we don't know how much of that is a placebo effect or regression to the mean or whatever because there's no control. However, there's another trial that was done by a group in New York, Barber and uh, his colleagues. And what they did was a trial that included a very different sample than in conventional clinical trials and a sample that was closer to matching the sample in the start of trial. It's a 16 week trial of search for lean with patients who are economically disadvantaged, 52% minority, highly comorbid, chronic, recurrently depressed, they just didn't use the conventional exclusion criteria. So it was this broad, whoever came, they just didn't exclude them. They did a nice thing that I liked a lot. People who didn't respond at eight weeks would switch to a different antidepressant. They would switch from sertraline to venlafaxine. And the thing I like especially about it is that people who didn't improve on placebos were switched to a different placebo. <laughs> okay. In part, keeping wine, in fact. So what did they get as improvement on drug and placebo? Here's the improvement they got on the drug, about the same that the STAR-D trial got. Not surprising, given that there was such similarity in the nature of the subject population. And here's what they got on placebo. Mm. No difference at all, and these are what, this is what you find in broadly representative populations. And it doesn't matter, yeah. and it doesn't matter what antidepressant you take. Here in comparator trials, our response rates for, SSR, for SSRIs, for NDRIs, for tricyclic antidepressants, for benzodiazepine even, virtually identical, and that's without considering TNFT. Most people I speak to don't 
you know what a TNF gene is, this audience might be different. How many of you know what TNF is? Okay, good. Uh, TNF gene is a drug that's approved for as an antidepressant in France, marketed under a number of different names in different countries. Most antidepressants, the most popular, well-known are the SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. TNFTN is an SSRE. It's a selective serotonin reuptake enhancer. <laughs> it's supposed to do exactly the opposite of what SSRIs are supposed to do. Instead of making more serotonin available in the synapses of the brain, it makes less serotonin available. If there were any truth at all to the serotonin deficiency hypothesis, TNF tain ought to make people worse. <laughs> what does it do? Here's what it does. <laughs> it doesn't matter. So one response that people have to this argument they say is, well, maybe there's different strokes for different folks. <laughs> you know, Depression is a heterogeneous category. And maybe see, some people don't have enough serotonin, and others have too much serotonin, and others have something else that's wrong. And so we, you have to match the drug to the patient. We don't know how to do that yet, so we do it by trial and error. And if you don't respond to one drug, we switch you to another drug. And you know, we switch people from one antidepressant to another, sometimes they get better. Ah, we found the right antidepressant. Well, here's a meta-analysis of clinical trials um, where they switched patients. And what they did was uh, they switched half of the patients and didn't switch the others. Kept the others on the same antidepressant. Double blind, so the patients didn't know whether they're being switched or not, okay? You switch patients, and a third of them who didn't improve on their first antidepressant improve and show a clinically, what they call a clinical response, 50% reduction in symptoms. I would not have choose, chosen that as a metric, but that's what they did, so that's what I can report to you. Remission, 18%. What about those? who just kept on the same antidepressant and not switched. It doesn't matter which antidepressant you take and switching from one to another does nothing more different than keeping you on, probably nothing more than taking you off the internet. Uh, standardized mean difference between switching and sticking is negative 0.17. Negative point one seven because it favors not switching the antidepressants, but it's not significant. And it doesn't matter what dose you take. So here's the other thing they do. Uh, oh, you're not getting better? We'll increase your dose. <laughs> when we did our meta-analysis, we went back and we looked at the, the fixed dose trials where you randomize to get this dose or that dose or that dose of an antidepressant. And they, they were, in our data set, there were 40 comparisons of different doses of antidepressants. One of those 40 comparisons showed a significant difference between high and low dose. It was one of the studies of fluoxetine, Prozac. It showed a better response to the lowest dose than to the highest dose. <laughs> Don't take that home. One out of 40, that's likely to be just a chance finding. The more important is that it doesn't matter what dose you prescribe. And on the label, the interesting thing, on the label they respond, they say there seems to be no relation between dose and response. And later on in the same label, they advise the clinician, if the patient doesn't get better, increase the dose. <laughs> so here's a meta-analysis in which you're looking at trials 
in which patients are randomized to either have their dose increased or not have it increased. Kept the same. What does it favor, the same or the other? Well, we look at all the trials. That's your effect size. Effect size. That's, those are tiny, tiny, tiny effect sizes. And non significant Looking at major depression studies only, looking at, at uh, studies up only on adults, and looking at studies with a low risk of bias. <laughs> it goes in the other direction, but it doesn't matter because all of the standardized mean differences are not significant. There's no dose response relationship on depressive symptoms with antidepressants. What do you call pills? the effects of which are independent of their chemical composition. I call them placebos, and they're to be taken with a grain of salt. <laughs> so, how should depression, oops, wrong button, how should depression be treated? One suggestion that has been made is that we could still prescribe antidepressants as active placebos. You heard the term active placebo, and active placebo is a drug that um, is an active drug, but is not known to have any effect on the condition being studied and being treated. And so they call that an active placebo, and they're sometimes used, um, and they've been used in some trials to protect blindly. A drug that should have no effect on depression usually is used atrophy, but does produce some of the side effects of Antidepressants like dry mouth to try and disguise. They said, why don't we do that? Use them as after placebos. Well, of course, you have to consider the risks as well as the benefits, especially if you use a drug that where the active ingredient is doing nothing beneficial at all. We have to try with the side effects, sexual dysfunction, weight gain, insomnia, diarrhea, gastrointestinal bleeding, you can go down the list. And you'll notice with SSRIs, the rate of sexual dysfunction is between 70 and 80 percent. And when I first saw that and started reporting it, people said, no, that's impossible. It can't be. Here are the data on it. Um, this is the rate of treatment, emergent sexual dysfunction on placebo. And there it is on SSRIs. Almost over 70 and 80. Sometimes, very often, it remits after you stop taking the drug. About 30% of the time, it doesn't. And there's now a term for that. And it's called PSSD, post-SSRI sexual dysfunction. Then, of course, we've got the problem of addiction. Among people who try to quit an antidepressant, 50% fail. 55% report withdrawal symptoms, and 27% say they are addicted. And then we have the health risk. <coughs> Most prominent and, and well-known of those are the suicidal behavior among children and young adults, which led the FDA in 2004 to impose a uh, uh, black box warning, warning that this was risk of antidepressants it might increase the risk for suicide. Here's an examples. So these are later data, but it's an example of the kind of data that the FDA was looking at when they made that decision. So these are suicide rates for 1,000 for people randomized to antidepressants versus people randomized to uh, placebo. Looking at all patients, for the suicides, uh, and here are the suicide attempts. Here's the suicides on drug and placebo. Here are the suicide attempts on drug and placebo. Looking at non-geriatric adults, same thing, the same thing. So they, in 2004, they imposed the black box warning. They put it on, and the critics since then have said, do you know what happened? Do you know what has happened? Suicide rates have gone up. Ever since 2004, you put on the black box warning, now more people are committing suicide. That's the result of it. Well, here's some data on that. 
This again from Mark Stone, who knows these data probably better than anyone else in, in, in the world. And what we're going to look at are graphs year by year, starting before the black box warning, going up to the present. The suicide rate per million graphed with the percent of the population is using antidepressants. And we'll start with kids, 10 to 14 years old, females and males. There's when the black box warning was put on. And what we will notice is, yes, they put on the warning. Both suicide rates and prescriptions of antidepressants for this age group decreased. And then they started prescribing them again, and they went back up, both. Just look at how close those lines match. Females and males 15 to 19 years old, same story. 20 to 24 years old, exact same story. 25 to 34 years old, no crisis of replication here either. Violent crime, big study in, in uh, uh, Sweden. With subjects as their own con controls, young people who had been put on antidepressants comparing their rate of arrest for violent crimes during their time on antidepressants compared to before or after. The elder, stroke, death from all causes, pregnant women, miscarriages, babies born with birth defects, persistent pulmonary hypertension, autism, neonat, uh, um, neonatal abstinence music, uh, syndrome, which is uh, uh, addiction. Again, you know, it's not just the parent, but the person taking the antidepressant that gets addicted, the person's pregnant, the child gets addicted and shows the exact same neonatal abstinence syndrome, withdrawal, and born in withdrawal, that are shown, that you see in babies born to women who are hooked on cocaine, heroin, methadone. I'm not the one that I'm, but the, 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 the doctor, the one who breaks the bad, the paper, the methamphetamine plants, blocking that. For everyone, there's an increased risk of type 2 diabetes, and deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. Then, brand new data, the effects of antidepressants on depression. I don't know it's brand new, but I just ran across it. These are antidepressants that list depression as a side effect. Yes. And then, maybe with that it would be less surprising that another risk is relapse. Antidepressants increase the risk for relapse, even though it's be short-term trials of antidepressants. Four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, you increase the chance of relapse. Here's some data on, on that. The thing you use, they usually talk about, they say, look, we have these uh, discontinuation trials. We take, have a trial of antidepressants, we take people who have improved on the drug, and we re-randomize half of them to switch, to switch them to placebo. And we do those, do that, half of them that are switched, relapse, or it's only 23% relapse if they're kept on the antidepressant. Now I would argue that these are people who are particularly likely to know that they've been switched to placebo, given they've been on the antidepressant just now, just they just switch. Some of them are getting withdrawal symptoms. But anyway, those are the data. That's what Lodgren was referring to when he said we qualified the short-term trial. Indeed, this leaves out a very important group of patients. Did you mean the 2012 instead of 1912? Thank you. Yes. I've got a clue to change that. <laughs> Glad you caught it. I'll change it before my next slide. <laughs> it leaves out a very important group of patients. What about those? What about those who got better, remitted on placebo? What if you just keep them on placebo, like you did with the people on the drugs? 
that's what you got now. Now, look at this difference. People's, I'm probably switched to placebo. People on placebo kept on placebo. About the same rate of remission, not that much difference, but here's relapse rates. Here's the increased relapse rate as a function of having had four to eight weeks on an antidepressant and then being taken off compared to just being on a placebo and staying on it. Uh, Paul Andrews, his master's university, did this lovely analysis looking at the rates of re relapse rates of different antidepressants as a function of what to what extent does this antidepressant enhance serotonin release? The effect serotonin. And here it is. And here it is with norepinephrine. The more that the drug mumps around with serotonin or norepinephrine in the brain, the greater the relapse rate. The more likely you're out to relapse. What do you think the mechanism is? I don't know. Some change is taking place in the brain. This is an active uh, a drug that. Um, could it be psychological rather than physiological? Could be. I really don't know. What I do know is when you look at these data, look at some more of the data, and then let's go back to that. Okay. Uh, here's the old NIMH collaborative trial treatment trial where they looked at imipramine, a tricyclic antidepressant, cognitive behavioral therapy, interpersonal psychotherapy, originally designed to be a control, placebo psychotherapy control, uh, and till placebo. Here's uh, the relapse rate on CBT. Here it is on interpersonal psychotherapy. Here it is on placebo. Here it is on imipramine. You have to figure out what the psychological effect might be. And then this marvelous study. Three hour trial in which depressed patients were randomized to either be given an SSRI, put on an exercise program, or given both the drug and the exercise program. After four months of this treatment, get good remission rates, but equal in all three groups. What about relapse at 10 months? People allowed, by the way, to continue their antidepressant or not, continue their exercise program or not. Here's the relapse rate on antidepressants on the SSRI just like you've seen in other studies. Here it is for exercise. Now what happens when you combine exercise and an SSRI? Are you going to get some benefits from each? Here's the relapse rate for those giving both treatments. All the way back up. Adding an SSRI to the exercise program quadrupled the rate of relapse. Puts on, get someone exercise, they get better. Add an SSRI, the more likely to relapse and get worse again. Is exercise a placebo? Well, maybe, maybe that's a psychological mechanism as well. But consider the side effects of antidepressants and compare them to the side effects of physical exercise. <laughs> And I will ask you, which placebo would you rather have? <laughs> if it is a placebo. Well, then maybe we should prescribe placebos. Of course, there's a problem. Conventional wisdom has it that if you know it's a placebo, it won't work. You need to think you're getting an active medication. One of the problems, we don't want to deceive our patients. We don't. I, don't, I love placebos. I don't believe in deception for a number of, of reasons, both principle and practical. Principle, patient autonomy, you should be respected. Practical, one of the 
foundations of the placebo effect, just trust in your clinician. And the clinician doesn't have to trustworthy manner. Uh, she will lose that trust. So very much against it. Depression, maybe we can talk about it later. I didn't include this here for time's sake, but actually we've been looking at what happens when you give people placebo and you tell them it's a placebo. And there's time maybe we can talk about that a little late, later. But fortunately, fortunately, we don't have to give placebos because there are many other treatments uh, for depression. Let's see how they work. And this is symptom reduction as a function of particular treatment. So here's what you already know. Antidepressants do slightly better than placebo in terms of improvement. That should be our benchmark. We want to at least equal the placebo effect, right? And hopefully improve on it some. The difference in this case is not is statistically, but not uh, clinically meaningful. Both of them are clinically meaningful in terms of their improvement they produce beyond being on the waiting list. Indeed, being on a waiting list is toxic. That's, that's uh, what they do. Standard care, which usually includes antidepressants, doesn't it these days. That does about the same as being on placebo. Psychotherapy, same as being on an active drug. And you have blind ratings. You put psychotherapy and placebo together, no better than either one alone. Exactly the same. Exercise, acupuncture, taking a moit make of three homeopathy, tai chi, qigong, and yoga. Everything works. Everything works. So how are we going to know what to choose as a treatment modality if everything works? Right here are my proposed guidelines. When treatments are equally effective, prescribe the safest. And clearly, from the data you've seen and the data you know, that's not antidepressant medication. When treatments are equally safe, prescribe what the patient prefers. In Studies of patient choice, 75%, three out of four, if you ask them, you'd rather get an antidepressant or psychotherapy, three out of four prefer psychotherapy. Give them what they want. There are also studies showing that patient choice makes a difference. If someone's allowed to choose their patient, they do better on their treatment, they do better on it than if it's chosen for them, even if it's the same treatment. So we don't have to prescribe placebos, but I, I, I wish we could. As, as I said, I, 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 I love placebos. <laughs> when I was living in the UK, I, I, I had this fantasy that I, I woke up in the morning, and I, it was sort of like a dream, you know, this fantasy that I would wake up in the morning and I'd open up my favorite UK daily paper. It's called The Independent. Yeah, the title, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the, the, my fantasy was that I would read that the FDA had approved placebo in doses ranging from 1 to 40,000 milligrams. I said, wow, wouldn't that be great? And I thought, gee, you know, if we could, if we could get an antidepressants approved, and you can't do this here, but in the U.S. and in New Zealand, yeah. the only two countries where you can do it, we could advertise them. In, in, in magazines and on television. You see, you know, you, you, how many of you are from the U.S.? Okay, so you've seen them. The other, I don't know if you've seen them. They have these ads. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's one of them, I remember, has this woman skipping through fields of flowers. <laughs> yes, I used to be depressed, and then I took my doctor prescribed. Talk to your doctor, Z. We can advertise it, and then I wonder what would a placebo advertisement look like? And I imagine it might look something like this. <laughs> Prevaricate. <laughs> a genuine placebo medication. <laughs> Tested in more clinical trials than any other treatment. 
so powerful, it's the standard by which other medications are judged. So effective, it can be used in the treatment of thousands of ailments. And safe enough to be given to infants, the elderly, and pregnant women. Remember, if it's placebo, you can believe it. <laughs> I thought I might conclude by reciting a poem of Shakespeare's. But then I thought, why should I? He never reads any of mine. <laughs> Still, when I ran across his ode to placebo, I couldn't resist. <laughs> Friends, colleagues, placebans, <laughs> Spare me your tears. I come to praise placebo, not to bury it. The evil doctors do lives after them. The good is often part placebo. The medical world's a stage, and placebo's merely players. Each one plays a different part. This one Prozac, that one morphine. The winter of our discontent is made glorious summer by these sugared pills. Yet nothing is real. The thinking makes it so. Thank you. exercise, we created a drug we named Resofia, and they actually produced the marketing materials for it. Nice. <laughs> I just want to say thank you for your work. I love watching you on YouTube, so this is like I'm fanning out right now. But um, <laughs> my question is, uh, as someone who has undergone antidepressant withdrawal, when I hear the word relapse, I think withdrawal. So can you talk about the difference between relapse and withdrawal and how doctors can now recognize the difference? When you take someone off an antidepressant and they show some symptoms right afterwards and they're depressive symptoms, they might be withdrawal and they might be relapse. I have no idea how to make a distinction between the two. On the other hand, you're unlikely to get withdrawal symptoms that don't start for it start four months later, a year later year and a half later. And when you get that, that's more likely, I would think, just seems logical, it to be uh, actual relapse whether it would, rather than withdrawal symptoms, because it doesn't fit the time course for withdrawal. So you get withdrawal symptoms and you get more relapse as two separable phenomena. Hard to separate them when they're acute, long-term, separable. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I think the thing you said about giving people what they want is major. And I think what the medical model has done is that it's marketed wanting pills as a treatment for their emotional distress, which I think is a major factor in whatever the success rate is for both placebo and antidepressants. So, you know, I prescribe people come in and they want drugs because they think that's what's going to help them feel better. And I prescribe it when they want it, although I work, they come into therapy with me, so I work with them and eventually help them get off of it. <coughs> but the wanting of drugs to treat what's happening in people's lives has been a major marketing success of the drug companies and the APA. So I have a question for you. Have you ever tried this and what you think, if you have what happened, if you, if you have what you think might happen, 
you have a patient, the patient wants drugs, and you've seen some of the data that I've presented, and you say, well, you know what works at least as well as conventional antidepressants, but is safer? Here are a few things that work as well. One is um, uh, omega-3 fatty acids. Take it as a supplement. You can also look at their vitamin D levels, and if they're deficient, that can be related to depression and like that. Uh, omega-3 fatty acids, or maybe homeopathic remedies. Look here the data. We know they are as effective, but they're safer, and they are physical. They're like drugs in the sense that they are the physical substance that you have. Yes, I do that. Uh, I take their blood work, I find out if they're deficient in that yeah. They try it two weeks later, doesn't work, and need the drug. Because they want, they're looking for a magic pill. Yes. And um, what happens when the drug doesn't work? Well, they're in therapy, so we're working on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm uh, Joe Tarantolo. I've always been a staunch supporter and ally of uh, Irving Kirsch. Now that I've heard his poetry, I'm reconsidering. <laughs> it wasn't mine, it was his. <laughs> uh, uh, a couple things. Um, I'm no longer going to use the term placebo, I'm sorry. I, uh, I decided uh, this past week, actually, that I'm going to use the term self-healing, not placebo. I hope, I hope this doesn't breach our relationship. But, um, the other thing, the other problem I have is with the term, or the, the phrase, it works, or it doesn't work. I usually use that, if the ceiling fan doesn't work, or the air conditioning doesn't work. But the notion of doing something substantive with it, another human being's life and saying it works or doesn't work is so mechanical that I'm dropping that out also of my lexicon. Um, and then the problem is I'm not a shaman. I'm not a shaman. Uh, I'm a, a capitalist. I, I, uh, I work for money. And, um, and, and this is what I'm promoting. I have, a, I have a, a process, I'm not even going to call it a treatment, it's expensive, it's hard work, there's no guarantee of results, and I don't guarantee so you don't get your money back, <laughs> it doesn't work. <clears throat> and I am competing with a cheap, simple, stupid treatment. So from now on, I'm just going to call it stupid. <laughs> Pharmacological treatment is stupid. I'm not going to say it doesn't work. It may work for stupid people. <laughs> I have to be careful here. I'll say it again, though. It may work for people who don't want to think about what it means to be a human being. Well, I'll take issue with some of that. But in front of no, me. please, please, yeah. take issue with that. I, I want to leave here corrected. I'm not necessarily going to correct you. If you leave here, we can have different takes on part of it and the same take on, on a lot of it. That's fine, too. Um, but <coughs> what do I want to say about that? Well, all right. Well, one, one more thing. Maybe yeah. you can help me with this. Um, you know David Collins' work. And he, he quotes your work as well. And he and David Jacobs published a paper about 10 years ago talking about these studies being irrelevant, forgetting about whether or not they showed anything, but that they were irrelevant to the complexity of the human condition. Everybody here has a different story. Every single person here has a different story. And, to, and it's very tempting to lump people well, how many are this and how many are that? 
and, and then put them into a category, right? But he's different than I am, and she's different than him. And the notion that we can lump them and then give a, a drug to change their life, you see, you see the problem, huh? I see, I see the problem. On the other hand, let me talk to you a little bit about a non septic placebo, and I'm still going to use the term placebo. The point about the term is actually well taken. Dan Mowerman, who's an anthropologist at the University of Michigan, has been campaigning for decades to get rid of the term placebo right? and replace it with meaning response. Meaning? Meaning. The meaning that this has for the individual. Person, patient, and his his argument is: Look, placebo by definition can't have an effect. Placebo effect is an, uh, uh, an oxymoron because the placebo is an inert, unless it's an active placebo, it's an inert, can't affect anything as a substance, and therefore the only thing that can be having an effect would be the meaning that this has for the uh, for the person. So he calls it the meaning response. The problem, of course, is that once a term has taken a hold, it's almost impossible to get rid of it. I can't tell you the number of times I've run into where people make proposals, we should change the name of this. I can only know one instance where it actually worked, and that's when mesmerism was changed to hypnosis back in the 19th century. And since then, all of the things that I've seen where people tried to do it, they failed. But let me give you an example of why I think why well, I would not discard the term placebo in general. And uh, something that maybe relates it more to the meaning response. One of the things that we've been, I've been fascinated with placebo effect. We have a group of, called uh, Program in Placebo Studies. We do research on placebos, placebo effects. We hope it will affect general medicine practice, not in the terms of having doctors prescribe placebo so much as by understanding the importance of their therapeutic relationship and how they behave towards the person they're working with and what's going to happen in that person's life rather than rely on, on pills. But we also want to harness the placebo effect in as many ways as possible. That's one way to do it. And one thing we've been doing lately is doing what we call open-label placebo. Placebo is just a pill. It's a pill that doesn't have the active ingredient in it. So using it in that term, I think it's okay. And what we do with people is we say, look, we did this first with the irritable bowel syndrome. We said, uh, here's one of the things that we know about your irritable bowel syndrome, is that placebos in clinical trials seem to be very effective for it. And we've been saying the placebo effect. We have some idea of some of the mechanisms, the way in which placebos work. We know that part of what happens, and this I think you might actually like, Joe, because this is the phrase we use, is placebo has no active ingredient. But you've been getting medications, treatments of various kinds, different conditions since you were a baby, and you've made an association between the way these are given, the pill, the injection, or whatever, and feeling better, getting better for this or for, or for that. So what's happened now is that these stimuli, the pills, the injections, have uh, come to help your body harness, that can be used to harness your self-healing capacities. That's the phrase use, self-healing capacities. It's not critical that you believe in it, although it helps. But what's important is that you take it as directed. And we give them a bottle of pills. And uh, the pills are labeled placebo. And it says on it, no active ingredient. And they're asked to, to take four pills, two pills twice a day. Because we know from the research that four pills work better than two placebo pills. So that's what we say. We send them home to another group that's in a no treatment control group. We've done this successfully with irritable bowel syndrome, chronic low back pain, and have a pilot study with depression when I get found out. Uh, with the low back pain, 
the control group continue to take their, their pain medication. In some cases, opioids more often go in states. So this was improvement they're getting beyond it. They got clinically significant improvement over and above the improvement that you get on NSAIDs for chronic low back pain. We've had patients come back to us and say, I know there's nothing in it, but it worked for me. Can I get a refill of the placebo? <laughs> it's, there are now two trials do, using this approach for cancer-related fatigue, uh, post-chemotherapy patients. One in Alabama, one at Harvard, worked in the sense of producing um, statistically it's significant the relief. It's the, it's the meaning of it. It's not the pill. It's not the ritual has a meaning for a person. It's the ritual. It's the ritual. We won't change the terms of placebo because it just won't succeed. And now it's gaining respectability. So we just make use of it. We capitalize on it. But we explain what it is. We explain that what it's doing is releasing yourself from the passage. When I say people get better in the waiting room, I guess I got the mic down so I hit the floor. Lee Coleman, for anybody who haven't been, I'm a psychiatrist, which would kind of go against what I want to say. Uh, I want to compliment the speaker. Joe, you know, my comments would be sort of a follow up, I think, on some of the things that Joe was saying. But my problem with so much emphasis on the placebo effect, and obviously, that we need. I don't think I need to repeat that to this audience. But my problem is that when people have to go to a professional to get a placebo, just like they go for these horrible drugs now, it still seems to me that they're going to end up with a feeling that if I have something wrong in my body, because the language, the milieu that people you go to, the whole thing emphasizes they're a patient. Just like somebody who has cancer or any other medical condition, where everything changes when you have a big known bodily disorder. Mm -hmm. So I think that while I can't hear anything that you're saying that I wouldn't agree with, I'm worried and I feel that the overall impact will give aid and comfort to the enemy. The enemy are the doctors and the drug companies, and you know who they are. And they're going to fight us to the death. And who's going to be dead unless we really get our shit together? It's not going to be them. So it seems to me that, although this is, of course, not what you want to see happen, I just am really worried that that will hasten our death because placebo, just the very word, who's, you know. So anyway, I think I, I'll just start repeating myself. <laughs>
much for your brilliant work. My name is Paula Kaplan. I want to say a few things really quickly. I was glad Joe mentioned the David Cohen and David Jacobs painting because um, underlying or behind or, or ahead of or whatever, everything you're saying, I keep thinking, but Cohen and Jacobs so brilliantly describe how depression, the word depression, is used in such a vast array of ways that it becomes practically meaningless. And so in all of your studies, anti, so-called antidepressants were given to people who had been labeled depressed. But who labeled them? And what validity does that term have? It's certainly not any DSM terms related to depression have any scientific um, foundation whatsoever. So that's, that's just one thing. And then the second thing I wanted to mention was um, many years ago, Emily Cohen and I did a study, did, did an evaluation of the FDA's um, criteria, the ones they say to the drug companies, if you want a new drug, a new antidepressant specifically approved by us, here's what you have to show us. Here, here are the studies you have to do. Um, it was published in New Scientist, and we were absolutely horrified. We said a 12-year-old kid who knows a little bit about research methods could drive a truck through all the problems. And those standards were so poor. And I haven't looked recently. It said these are going to be revised in, and it was 10 years after that that they, they were still in that form. So I just wondered if you could comment on that. And one other quick thing, which is uh, when, you, when you showed the comparison of other kinds of approaches, like Qigong and meditation and so on, um, what's left out of there is a vast array of things that are helpful. Like, and I'm not gonna use the word therapy, I hate that, participation in the arts, music, dance, drama, um, having a friend, having a safe place to live, all of those have been documented as helping with the vast array of things that people call depression. Yeah, um, I'm gonna make a couple comments. Uh, first of all, the idea that this word depression covers too large, uh, too many things, and too many different conditions really that are subsumed in it. That's an argument that's actually nowadays made against my work. And they say, oh, well, you see, there are different kinds of depression. Depression is a big umbrella uh, category. And the antidepressants work for some of them, but not for the others. So we just have to figure out which kinds of depression the, the pills work for and which kind they don't. So well. But the drug companies don't want to do their research because it means limiting their market and, and cutting it out. And I remember nice I wanted to get some data from them to see whether what kind of antidepressant might work better for men and what kind for women. And not, not one of the companies was either sending the data or doing the analyses. And this is the official government body that's setting treatment policy for the NIH. Second thing has to do with the message, and I think it's a very important point that you brought up the message about, well, this means there's something wrong with it. It's internal, and so I think you go with it to see why not my uh, help. Of course, that's why we talk to them about releasing their own self-healing capacity as what the ritual to see what is going to is uh, going to do. But one of the ways to think about depression is that it's not brain dysfunction, it's not an abnormal state, it's a normal reaction to an abnormal state of affairs. Normal reaction. Abnormal conditions create suffering of various kinds. Right. And if you want just an extreme example, it seems like it has nothing to do with it. I go like this and bang my arm and break a bone in my wrist. The breaking of the bone in my wrist is a normal reaction. That doesn't mean that there's something wrong with my wrist congenitally or whatever. It's a normal reaction, but I'm suffering. Medicine in general has two purposes, prolonged life and relieves suffering. What other purpose would medicine have? When someone is suffering, if you, you want to find some way to help alleviate that suffering, suffering, regardless whether it's a natural condition, it's an abnormal condition, it's an illness, it's whatever it's causing, this 
tougher, you want to find some ways to, to help people cope and deal with it. That should include changing the environment and helping them change the environment. And one of the things that would go back to the old NIH study, they were looking at which psychotherapists had better results with, with people who were depressed and which had worse results. So there's a big difference in treatment, even when the only treatment is giving them a pill, some psychiatrists do better with the placebo than others do with the pill. It just it, 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 it depends on, on the nature of the, the, the therapeutic relationship and, and uh, uh, things of that sort. Yeah, therapeutic alliance is, is, is a big part of what it, uh, makes the... the no SIBO. No SIBO. So, so the no SIBO. <laughs> so SIBO is evil. Yes. You know, everyone know what the no SIBO is? No SIBO effect. No SIBO is the, sometimes described as the SIBO's evil twin. <laughs> People who get worse because they expect to get worse. But you know, having some confidence that something will work can help kickstart something working. And yes, the other day, the, 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 the NIH study, here's, here's what they found in terms of the people who did better psychotherapists with depressed patients, those who were willing to talk about things like their economics condition, their employment conditions, the kinds of real world social issues that could help generate sadness, suffering, depression, anxiety, because that's normal in the reaction to something like that. This is kind of going backwards. I like where the direction of the conversation is going now, but I'm going to go ahead and throw it in. In, a, in the 80s, I was studying Ericksonian hypnotherapy with a team at Shepard Pratt, physician, psychologist, and medical, I mean, uh, psychiatrists, so all three. And they wrote a book called Irresistible Communication. And one of the things that they did is they were working with children who were burn victims. They, they rode in the ambulance from the burn scene to the hospital, then um, worked with kids at the hospital, then some days later. And by using focused attention through hypnotherapy, they were able to change the rate of healing and the amount of pain they experienced. Now you can select out all kinds of reasons for that. But why I was bringing this today, because of your interest in placebo, is that directed attention or focusing is what I think is part of what makes the placebo work. You notice that acupuncture was high on your list there. That's a way of focusing with a needle into the skin. Through, through millennium, the ability to focus energy is a profound thing. And I think that that's one of the things that's going on when you take your pill four times a day, or when you, the routine is you're now giving yourself um, self-healing, and you're focusing, or your family focuses on you, hey, did you remember your pill? You know, this kind of grabbing attention and putting it to work, I think is a lot of what the power is of, of what we're talking about, whether we're talking about empathy, or, you know, et cetera. So. Yeah, and here's something that you might find more memorable than describing a placebo pill. And that's something that a uh, Danish psychologist, Niels Bach, has uh, done recently and has talked about. He's been prescribing to his clients um, imaginary pills. Huh? You like that? You know what he says? And sometimes we use hypnosis, but most often not. And he talks about what it is they're looking to get and gain from it. So now, if you were to take a pill for that, what would it look like? What color would it be? We know the different colors, placebos, by the way, have different effects. So blue so placebos are particularly good for sedation and relaxation, and red placebos and white placebos are good for pain relief and then increasing the energy. So he talks about, talk about the color and the size and what dose they should take, and the, the, the patient tries tries it out in the office and imagines the pill and then imagines the pa patient throwing pictures with it. Feels some improvement and he says, now that you've done this, 
you can carry this with you. And take an imaginary pill every time you need to. The person knows it's imaginary. They know that they are, what they're doing is doing something to trigger their own internal capacities. That's one thing. The second thing about acupuncture, something to bolster your argument. Uh, is the, the, or the difference between the effectiveness of different placebos. Acupuncture is a particularly strong placebo. And one of the reasons that we know that is that we have studies of sham acupuncture. And we have these needles that don't pierce the skin. And, and we put them in the wrong place. And that becomes the sham acupuncture control. It works wonderfully. It works wonderfully. Minimal differences between real and sham acupuncture, but both are great. Sham acupuncture does better than placebo pills. So what winds up happening is if you look at the difference between real medication and <coughs> placebo, and you find a difference, you look at that same condition, seems to be on the same white face, other condition, and you look at real versus sham acupuncture, or, or real, you get a very small difference, if any. But the sham acupuncture is doing better than the placebo pill, and at least as good as the real medication. It doesn't matter where you put the needle, it doesn't matter if it actually strips the skin, but there's something about that ritual. The needle that does something that can hold his attention. Uh, I want to add a little piece to that. <clears throat> In the late 1960s, um, I petitioned to have uh, the term placebo effect uh, removed and, and with the substitution of unspecific factors. Uh, obviously, that didn't go over too well. Um, but there's an interesting study that was also done in the late 1960s by a fellow named Stanley Schachter at Columbia University, in which he took a bunch of people and put them in a small room with vents like this, uh, and he, in, in, in one room, uh, he had norepinephrine, which was odorless, colorless, uh, shot through the vents. And all of the people except one person were not in on the plot. This one person was his confederate, and he jumped up and said, oh my god, in the first room, uh, somebody, something's happening to me. My heart is quickening. My pulse is racing. Um, you know, the, the room is spinning. Uh, I, 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 my, the lights are brighter. And all of those people, you know, got very anxious. OK. Next room, same uh, confederate with a number of people who were uh, selected to match in a number of ways, IQ, socioeconomic strata, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, with the first group, the same person says, oh my goodness, there's something happening. I don't understand it. My pulse is working, my heart is racing. I feel suddenly, you know, uh, so without light and, and, and uh, all is well in the world and I, I just feel so terrific. I feel a sense of well-being. And, uh, and that group felt a sense of well-being. He called this, uh, and I think this has to do with what you were talking about, meaning making and the meaning of the science group. Call this attribution theory. What you name something makes it what it is. And typically, that may be some of the response some people have to wanting to know what their diagnosis is. Uh, I'm anti diagnoses. I don't think anybody here, as Joe points out, is the same as anybody else. We have similarities. But I fashion myself into being a fingerprintologist. Because each person has his own unique and totally different psychological fingerprints. And that's what I treat, individual differences. Though they may have lots of things in common, the meanings are what are important to me. So, all good to wait. Trying to support what you're saying. We're going to have to end there. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Kirsten for coming. And your talk is very interesting.